Hi, I'm Ari. And I'm Ayla. And we're from Breeze High School. Recently, we've taken part in a Lessons from Auschwitz online educational course. And today, we're going to share our knowledge and information that we have learned and our reflections as we think it's such an important issue that still needs to be talked about. And we have Leah and Holly behind the scenes helping us as well. In our podcast, we thought it was extremely important to start with the definitions of what we're going to be talking about so you have a clear understanding of what we'll be exploring and going into depth to today. According to the United Nations, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life, carefully to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births from the group or forcibly transferring group ch- children of the group to another group. Anti-Semitism is one of the main causes of the Holocaust. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance defines anti-Semitism as a perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards them. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community, institutions and religious facilities. The Holocaust Educational Trust defines the Holocaust thus. The Holocaust was the murder of approximately 6 million Jewish men, women and children by Nazi Germany and its collaborators during the Second World War. For the first time, and so far only, time in history, a state and its accomplices attempted to murder every single member of a people. The Nazis considered Jews an existential threat, racially, separate, inferior and unchangeable. For this reason, historians apply the term the Holocaust, only to the murder of Jews, rather than the Nazi persecution, generally to highlight this, the the unprecedented nature. The first part of our course, we looked at the pre-war Jewish life. It was extremely important to look at the lives of the Jews before the war and before the Nazi persecution. We came across photos where we saw that the Jews were living a completely average to normal life. They were integrated within their communities and had loving families with many opportunities. We looked at case studies from Lithuania, Greece, France, Poland and Hungary and across all these case studies one thing was clear. Jewish people were normal people living normal lives before Nazis took over. They were integrated in their countries until the new prejudice came in. In part of our um, educational course we learned about a survivor, Kitty. I'm going to share my reflections of what I thought hearing her stories. I think it was very interesting to learn about a real human experience and how normal their life was before the Holocaust and how much of a humane experience they were living before. I found it really interesting to see how integrated Jews were in society and how Kitty had many friends from Catholic schools and how normal it was for Jews to interact with others and people of other religions. I also think the fact that Kitty, although she knew that she was Jewish and went to a Jewish primary school, that she never did actually practice her religion. The fact that her village in Poland never did expose her to any anti-Semitic views and must have been a real shock when the Holocaust happened. The fact that as a young person she was stoned at a swimming competition because of her religion is just disgusting and honestly shocked me. Her message towards the youth today is to learn from the Holocaust and be prepared if anything like this was to happen again and we would know what to do and not to stand for it. She has lived ever since and has been liberated. She's documented everything and dedicated her life to this cause. One way for her to revolt, in a sense, was to avoid doing work at camps. And it was ways like this and other Jews about that helped them survive this experience. And part of sharing their story has been said as a way of therapy for them. Auschwitz-Birkenau was one of the largest concentration camps. Out of 1.3 million people sent to Auschwitz, 1.1 million people died there. Not just Jews were sent to Auschwitz, Groups such as gay men, black people and Jehovah's Witnesses were also sent there. 110,000 Poles imprisoned from their homes despite not committing any crimes just simply for a living in an area were sent there because the Nazis wanted to claim that. There's a case study of Chislawa, who was a 14-year-old girl who was so young and terrified she didn't understand why she was there or couldn't understand her guards so began beating her with a stick. This shows the extreme horrible cases that Jews amongst other groups had to go through. In 1941, they expanded the camp to create a labour camp and war. By 1942, they decided that this camp would be a murder camp and that the Nazis' mission would be to kill all Jews. Many were sent there. Due to its easy access to railroads and being so large, 
was a main extermination camp. One in ten Jews said they were chosen to slave labour. The rest were sent to gas chambers. Death now or death later, as those sent to work would survive up to six weeks to three months. The prisoners' names were changed to numbers that they would have to wear, this therefore stripping away their identity. Conditions for those who were kept alive were awful, unhygienic and overcrowded, and work lasting from dawn till dusk. Prisoners were beaten for the smallest mistakes or even killed and punished for no reason. As soon as weaknesses were shown, they were murdered. Prisoners were then sent on death marches where they would walk up to 35 miles in a freezing cold to trains that would take them to these camps. Many were executed on the way or died due to the conditions. On the train rides for the Jews to get to the camps, they were extremely overcrowded and unhygienic. They were forced to use a bathroom and a bucket in front of everyone and all were forced to share and drink the same water. It smelled awful, people were crying and kids were hungry. The Nazis didn't care about the prisoners. Stuffing people on tra trains, adults Jews costing third class transportation prices, children under 10 half as much and children under four costing nothing. They packed them on trains and cattle carts for even lower prices. These cattle carts were also known as freight trains. The SS only had to pay for the return uh, tickets for guards as they knew for Jews it was only a one-way ticket. In order for the Holocaust to work, people's journeys to get to Poland, there had to be guards on the train and drivers. I think personally, although they should be held responsible, their act is somewhat cowardice. I think that even if they did attempt to speak out, they wouldn't be heard or they would be punished. I can imagine being forced into a position to help such an awful time in history, but there's no guarantee that the train drivers even knew where they were taking these people. However, nobody working for the people were forced into the, to be in the Holocaust, and that makes them just as bad. I think that although they are not the, ma the main perpetrator, they are not just a bystander. When they arrived at these camps, they were told to leave their luggage, and they were lied to that they would get their things back. SS doctors would assess each person on arrival, deciding their fate. Children under the age of 14 were almost always sent to the gas chamber straight away. Sometimes prisoners would, wor uh, would work helping with arrivals and would get a chance to whisper to children to say they were older and try and save them. No matter what it is, it was a death sentence. To the gas chamber or to die through labour, disease or starvation. Families were split, tired, confused and fearful. The living conditions were small, tiny places to stay and were far too overcrowded often with Jews lying on top of each other. Awful rations of bread, water and very watery soup, which was minimal, and the daily calorie intake was 600 a day. All prisoners were expected to work, back-breaking work, and diseases were extremely prevalent due to unhygienic living, so they ended up with diseases such as typhus. They were allowed two toilet breaks a day, but many prisoners ended up soiling themselves, making it worse in close spaces and spread of disease quicker. Cleanliness was impossible. Nazis tried once again to dehumanise prisoners by giving them holes over a ditch's toilet, do it in front of each other. There was no plumbing, plumbing to remove waste, so prisoners had to do it, and there was no way to clean themselves after a great machine to reduce as beasts, was a quote used. Washing and trying to stay human was a way of resistance for many, but it was incredibly difficult. The barracks were tiny, uncomfortable, cold, unsanitary, inhumane, and were actually built for animals, and they were incredibly overcrowded. One way of revolt against the workers of the camp were for the Jews to practice their religion. They began reciting their prayers and songs and celebrating their religion despite where they were. Many little traditions are things that are passed down in, uh, within, within the Jewish community. However, they had been taken away along with their homes, along with their place of worship as well. They were able to use the world around them as a structure. Men relied on prayer while women relied on recipes, not to cook, but to share with each other. People managed to smuggle in religious objects, prayer boxes in return for daily rations. People would do this for a chance to have their prayer and religion and give them more strength and resilience. When women found candles, they were so excited to, let, to light them for God. They were grateful to be alive. When they were on their way to the gas chambers, there was a resistance of singing songs. They knew their lives were about to end, but they could still have a, they could still go in saying the same words as their grandparents. The gas chambers and crematoria. Nine out of every ten Jews uh, died. One point one million were murdered at the end of the tracks after a six-minute walk away from the camp. 
prisoner guards had to take the Jews and help them undress, uh, lie them in order to kill them uh, through the gases. The prisoners were forced to clear the chambers and bury the bodies, chaos at every level. The living areas smelled of death. If now you were to visit Auschwitz Birkenau or go online, you would find a book of names. It was used as a remembrance tribute. 4.2 4.2 million names, multiple books filled with small print names, yet there was over 6 million Jews killed. Where did they go? Many people's existence disappeared as no one noticed when they were taken or were killed before they could document it or simply it was too long ago to remember. The Book of Names is so important to humanise a Holocaust, so it isn't just statistics. As soon as each individual victim is given a name and a life you're, and you're told the story, it really emphasises really how horrific this time in history was and the severity of what happened. It's important to remember that whilst the Holocaust was a genocide which took place, which took the lives of millions of people, each person was affected by it and had the character, aspirations, family and a life of their own. The Book of Names reminds us uh, that, uh, that fact that every victim was an individual and that as well as the vast numbers and statistics related to the Holocaust, we should always remember the individual lives that were lost. As you share uh, your learning with the local community, Um, It's really important that you remember this, how every single person had life. It is also important to remember the many other genocides that happen still today in this world, such as the Rwandan genocide, which killed so many people. And the things that are happening in China when they are segregating Muslims is just so similar to what happened in the genocide that was the Holocaust. That is so important that we don't just focus on this issue, but remember how relevant it still is today and that these things do still happen and it's not just in the past. From us at Braze, we want to say a big thank you for listening to our podcast. We think it's so, so important to bring to light the issues about the Holocaust and really humanise the experience and really tell all to you that it's still a contemporary problem that needs to be dealt with. And if something was to happen again, we wouldn't just sit by and let it. We also want to say a big thank you to the Holocaust Educational Trust for giving us the opportunity to study this and have more insight into the Holocaust.